Welcome to episode 129 of the Thunder Underground podcast. My name's Trent. I'm joined by Jason. And we've got a great one this week because, pun intended, Mark Kendall of Great White is here. You're pun believable. Oh, wow. See, I just did it You just took it to another level. That's what I do, man. Right. That's what I do. (laughs) Mark Kendall making his return to the podcast. He was on here last year. Very excited to have him back. Before we get into that, we're going to talk about a few things. First being, wanted to throw a shout out to this concert that's going on this coming weekend in Missouri. It's called Bands Against Bullying. And this is put on by DMG Productions in joint with Rock Rage Radio and Honest Brutality. And this is a benefit for a, a girl in Neosho, Missouri, Erica Smith, who took her own life after being bullied. Yeah. So... Chris and some others, you know, had the idea, let's put this benefit show on, you know, to raise awareness. And they've got 10 bands out there. It's only 10 bucks. So what's that breakdown to, you math geniuses? $1 per band. Nice. And every single one of these bands is well worth more than a dollar. Yeah, so, definitely. And that, the cool thing about it is you can bring your whole family because it's an all-ages outdoor event and kids under 12, I think, are free. Okay. And it's also got free camping, free parking, all that kind of stuff. So just... Get out there and have a great day. They're, uh, where are we at here? Severmind, Caliber Theory, Machine in the Mountain, Crane Technique. See right there? I'm sold. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm going. Okay, Under the Radar, Switchback, One Nation Under, Waking the Sleeper, Forsaken Few, and Claim Your Enemy. Nice. That's 10 bands, and we've seen seven of those live and, and we, we can attest that every damn one of those are great and i'm sure the other three are as well yeah it's solid you're gonna love it yeah i mean all these bands are fantastic and it's you, a great cause yeah and that's that's the main thing is a great cause get out there it's 10 bucks chris does a great job with these events we just talked on our last episode about rocklahoma and the stage he had out there the dark side stage did an amazing job with that the shows he's put on that we've gone to in tulsa just happy to Call this guy a friend and be a part of what he's putting on and really happy that he's doing something like this. So get out there. If you're in Missouri, Arkansas, Kansas, Oklahoma, this is an easy drive to Neo Show. So good thing for a Saturday. Do it. June 10th. All right. Couple, what, two or three weeks ago. Yeah. I'm going to use the word mighty <laughs> because it is very well, a very good word to use, even though they're not mighty in the sense that Three, four, 90% of the world hasn't even heard of them. I know. But they're mighty in a sense that their music is mighty. And that's the Night Flight Orchestra. Yes. Has put out their third album, Amber Galactic. The first two albums, the word phenomenal does not describe. It's beyond that. Yeah. This one is right there with them. Oh, man. I mean, just like I was, like we were saying in there a minute ago, the consistency of, I mean, nothing gets by these guys. Everything, every single note of everything they've recorded is bombastic. Yeah. I'm serious. I mean, this uh, it should be like the number one band in the country. Uh, we talk about this kind of stuff. Every band should be the number one band in the country. But, I mean, these guys, it's just, I mean, wow. I don't even know. Uh, it, it, because it's just like, you know, if they got together once and did an album, man, that was great. You know, because they're kind of a, you know, a super group, if you will. Yeah. Um, But, I mean, they're on their third one now, and it just, it it hasn't faltered. I mean, at all. I mean, in no way. And you touch on something that I thought. Whenever that first album came out, we were both like, man, this is amazing. But I just thought, hey, we got something. We got lucky to to get this in our lives, but that's it. Mm Mm-hmm. And then when they announced they're doing a second one, I was like, holy shit. And here we are. It's like, this is a number three, a real thing. Yeah. And I mean, it, you said super group. It features <clears throat> guys from Soul Work and Arch Enemy. And when you say those two names, obviously you think of, you know, heavy ass music. Yes. I mean, both those bands are heavy. Arch Enemy is like borderline death metal. If you yeah. call it that, it's melodic death metal. And Soul Work always gets thrown in that category as well, even yeah. though his voice you know, kind of transcends death metal. But anyway, it's speed from soil work singing. And it just shows you how amazing a vocalist this guy is yeah. with the stuff he does with night flight orchestra. Cause they're not that kind of music at all. They're a throwback 
to the 70s and 80s arena rock yeah. is the best way to encapsulate everything. The, the AOR kind of thing, the yeah. album-oriented rock. Right. I mean, it's not it's not hair metal or anything, but it's just, it, it, it touches on that kind of, the big rock of the late 70s and like really early 80s, yeah. to me anyways. Yeah, you so. can throw out band names like Foreigner, Boston, Kiss. Yeah. You can even, there's even stuff that sounds like Fleetwood Mac. Yeah. Sammy Hagar. And in this album, pushes it to an even further level where they got disco stuff mixed in here. Yep. And it's not disco in the sense that it's fucking cheesy. It's like, it works. Yeah. And you don't think, oh, I'm listening to disco. It just it feels like you're in the 70s. But, yeah. And, and I like what you said a minute ago, uh, Kiss. A lot of times I hear early Kiss, yeah. like really early Kiss in their stuff. I mean, it's just, uh, I, I mean, it's phenomenal. I, I just, I... I I can't imagine upon hearing it, you would hate it. So go look them up, buy their stuff, listen to Night Flight Orchestra. Yeah, I mean, you can pick up any three of these albums and be yeah. perfectly happy. Exactly. But I was thinking about it when I listened to this new one, that, you know, that not only that disco element, but a few other more 80s elements thrown in, mm-hmm. that it's a little more broad than the first one was, and even the second one. But if I was going to tell someone to listen to this band, I like you said, if you like anything of this kind of music, you're going to love it. I would think if you just put on the first one, listen to all three in a row, you get a total feel because you hear the complete progression yeah. and the entirety of what these guys have done in this short period of time. Because it's only been, what, five years now yeah. that they put out these three albums. Exactly. And... I can't imagine a world without Night Flight Orchestra. That's, <laughs> That's how much right. I love this band. And the first two yeah. albums we had, the first one two years ago was, or the second one two years ago was number one on our list, yeah. right? Of the yeah. year. And this, the one before that was number two, I think, That's behind right. maybe the Winery Dogs debut. Yeah. And, and, and you know, there, the, this is a case where it's like, oh, I like this album better than this album. You know, blah, 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 blah. Every fucking album is amazing. Yeah. I mean, none of them suck. So, I mean, it's all like you could put it all together in one gigantic album. Yeah. Because it's all amazing. And then they're all my favorite. Hashtag all killer no filler. That's right. I mean, uh, we sound like stupid, gushy fanboys, but I mean. But we are with this band. Yes. Literally nothing about this band sucks. Nothing. Yeah. And his vocals were great on the first time because he's great. But that was the first album that he did anything outside of metal, you know, to mm-hmm. my knowledge, at least. Yeah. On a recorded level. And this, by this third album, just in that short period of time, you see how much he's progressed in this style of music. Yeah. And man, I just pray that these guys would find a break between what Arch Enemy's doing and Soul Works doing and do a tour. <laughs> yeah. You know, because obviously, US. yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, they they've got to, yeah. yeah, they've got to do those bands because that's where the paycheck comes in. That's you know? right. <laughs> yeah. You know, because Night Flight Orchestra Tour in America. Is going to be playing really small places unless yeah. they get on open for someone. Yeah, they really are. They need to get on tour with like Dead Daisies and mm, Kiss. Yes, no there kidding. There you go. <laughs> but, you know, like you'd mentioned Saturn and Velvet. That's a great fucking song. Yeah. I love Jenny. That's a great song. Not I love Jenny, but it's called Jenny, but I love that song. There you go. Night Midnight Fire, yeah. the opening track. It's hard to say because, like you said, all three albums, fantastic. That. Might be my favorite song of theirs ever. Okay. It's that good, but, you know, the first two albums are full of fantastic stuff. And there's there's another Gemini's song. Gemini's Badass. Yeah, that one too. I can't remember one of these songs he he uh, call, he uh throws out, Edge of Seventeen. And in the first on the first album in, I think it's West Ruta Avenue, he says, you know, Stevie Nicks on my mind. So I think this dude's a big fan of yeah. Stevie Nicks. Probably. <laughs> And it's evident because there's at least this song on this new album and the last album that have a real Fleetwood Mac feel. And then you turn around and you have a real Kiss feel. And it just, it's, yeah. like we said, they encompass all these bands. But the thing is, they do it better than a lot of these bands are doing now. (laughs) Yeah, that is You know, not to say they're better than Fleetwood Mac or Kiss, but they are like, their recorded music is as good as anybody out there in the world at this moment. That's right. I mean, so... Have you people been listening? We fucking love this band. Hashtag fanboy. Go listen. <laughs> right. I mean, you can even turn this episode off now, just as long as you go listen to Nightflower Orchestra, and we won't be 
too mad about it. Well, you better come back because you got to listen to some Mark. Kendall. Oh, that's right. That's right. Never mind. I'll shut up. I'll let you just handle the rest of the episode. <laughs> no, Mark Kendall is mad at you right now. No, never. <laughs> He's too nice to be mad at anybody. That's right. All right. So last Friday night, Tom Kiefer and his solo band came to Tulsa, the ideal ballroom. We just sounded like fanboys. I don't know how to do this without sounding like a fanboy. <laughs> hey, you know what? That's that's what this podcast is. We we're, should just change know, the name to Thunder Fanboy. Girl. Yeah, we're, we're talking about the shit we love. You know, it's all good, man. Right. You, you, you've got my permission. Okay. <laughs> you've got my approval. <laughs> well, before we get into Tom Kiefer, we've got to talk about rocket science. Okay. We've oh yeah talked about them many times and going way back. The thing to point out is they're the first interview we've ever had on this podcast that's right there i think it was episode number seven scott and Jana were on here and it wasn't long after they had started doing rocket science yeah and they had been before that doing a different cover band octane blue and then before that of course down for five the almighty down for five yes right almighty that's a good word yes hopefully one day we hear some more from down for five you never I know i just threw that in there so <laughs> they could hear me say that put a bug in their ear <laughs> yeah <laughs> Well, and you know, we also talked about having Scott on for like an all '80s metal episode, and we still never did it. Yeah, this is that's one of the long running things. Yeah, because we're procrastinators, like yeah. to the first order. Because we've always wanted to do an episode where we just talk randomly about glam rock yes. and '80s rock, and get into the obscure ones yeah. and everything. And as far as anyone that we personally know, he knows that stuff better than us. Yeah, and he's. The one person I know that could completely carry a conversation with me and you about that stuff. So. We got to do it. We yeah. have to do it. We've said it here on here again, I think. So maybe <laughs> now we'll force ourselves into doing this. Fine. Yes. <laughs> but anyway, if, if you're in the Tulsa area, rocket science plays around town a lot. And the thing that differenti differentiates them from a regular cover band is that they've got a full on stage production and you don't see that from cover bands. And I mean, they've got, you know, this full-on rack system, system, whatever you want to call it, this big, huge, you know, setup and everything with lights, you know, that are programmed to the music mm -hmm. and smoke and everything. And it's just a big production. And it's really cool, you know, because someone goes to a bar on a Saturday night, you know, oh, there's some band playing and you go in there and you get lost in it because it's not yeah. just four dudes on stage going through the motions playing, you know freaking taking care of business or yeah. something you know it's <laughs> it's four people on stage playing music they love and they they focus on the 80s stuff but i know they also go into the metal vein mm -hmm. with maiden and priest and everything and they also go outside of that sometime into some 90s rock yep but i, I know yeah, yeah yeah definitely so get out there and check out rocket science to get a chance they've opened this show they also opened for docking when they came through with ideal and of course with this they have to have a scaled down of course thing yeah. because you know they're an opening act but they got up there and they did their thing. They focused on the, the 80s stuff with Motley Crue and Poison and Kiss and uh, Judas Priest and everything. And it sounded great. That's awesome. You know, Scott has always been a good singer. But every time I see him, you know, I just see he just owns that mic a little bit more, yeah. you know. Because he spent years and years, you know, at least from our experience seeing him, you know, just playing bass. Yeah. And so now he's really taking over that role as a great front man. That's great. You know, one thing about Scott, whether it's if you're seen as a singer or when he played bass, you know, he always had a presence. Right. Always fun to watch him play. Yeah. You know. And then Jana, I mean, what can you say about I mean, her as a guitarist? Powerhouse. Powerhouse. She's one of those people that you see and you're like, why doesn't the whole world know about this yeah. woman no as a guitarist? That's right. I mean, that's how good she is. And case in point... You know, we weren't at the Dawkins show, but I watched the YouTube video. I'm sure you did when yeah. she was on stage with Dawkins playing. Yes. Was it It's Not Love, I think? Um, she got up there and, and played guitar. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, you're playing a George Lynch part, you know. Obviously, in place of John Levin at this show. But, I yeah. mean, you're up there playing parts of an amazing guitarist. Uh, well, and she you perfectly can... do it without a problem. Oh, yeah. She, she, she could do George Lynch all day. We know right. that. Yeah. I mean, there you go. John Levin's good, but Janice should be in Dockin' right now. <laughs> nice. <laughs> but no, they just, they played the idea opening for Tom Kiefer. It sounded huge. They sounded great. Like I've said before, you can't say enough good things about these guys, and you got to get out there and see them. If you're anywhere in the area, it's worth, you know, making plans for and getting out there and seeing them one weekend when you can. Gotcha. 
Well, then Tom Kiefer took the stage. Okay. And <laughs> admittedly, this is Cinderella was one of my favorite bands of that era when I was growing up. Still to this day, it never gets old to me. And the thing to note about Tom Kiefer is that if you haven't seen him live, you must do this at the first chance you get. Because of anyone from that era that should sound like shit on stage, it's him. <laughs> yeah. But of anyone from that era that sounds great on that stage, it's him. He's This guy blew out his voice twice. Yeah. Twice he had to stop completely doing what he lives to do. Had vo vocal surgery, and he, now he comes back. And I'm serious. Don Dockin, Stephen Piercy, Mark Slaughter, Vince Neil, all these motherfuckers need to go sit down in a chair in front of him <laughs> and watch how to fucking do a show. You know, and I love those guys I just listed. Yeah. Well, except for Vince Neil Live. But <laughs> I, I love the other three. Yeah. And they're good enough on stage. But this guy is the guy, like I said, should be good enough. Uh, yeah. You expect him to not be as good as he used to be because of the issues he had and because yeah. of the type of voice he has. But he was just, it was unbelievable. It was like watching Cinderella in 1990. That's great. You know what I mean? I don't. That's what you want. Yeah. I mean, and even, you know, like on the solo album. At the beginning of Solid Ground, he lets out that scream, and he did that live, and it sounded perfect. Wow. And then, you know, all the, you know, from the solo album, he played a ton of stuff from it. He played Solid Ground, It's Not Enough, Thick and Thin, The Flower Song, um, and The Way Life Goes. And then he hit almost every Cinderella hit you could think of. Yeah. You know, some of the smaller ones, like... The more things change or push push he didn't play yeah. but i mean he he even he opened the show with still climbing wow the title track from the the cinderella album that me and like five other people bought <laughs> you know? that's crazy you know and i fucking Don't you love, love when a band does that yeah i mean especially he pulled out a deep cut from an album that most people don't own and then he opened the show with it and it's it was amazing wow that's awesome i love that yeah and then of course he played you know, it was cool. You know, it got towards in the show. I thought, oh, you know, we're not going to hear uh, Coming Home. But then he played it next. You know? So it was like, he played all that stuff. You know, of course, Night Songs, one of the best songs of that era. There you go. Then he played Shake Me and um, Gypsy Road. and That's the one for yeah. me right there. <laughs> the, the Last Mile, which <clears throat> was great. And then, of course, Nobody's Fool, Don't Know What You Got Till You're Gone, Heartbreak Station, The Ballads. Oh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this is, it's just a great show. His band sounds great. You know, he's got his wife up there and another girl doing backups. And he's got two guitarists. He plays guitar, keyboardist. Paul Taylor's not there anymore, by the way. Oh, okay. Unfortunately. But oh, man. It still, it survived. Hell, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, so just without, you know, completely going fanboy again. Yeah, it's just, I can't say enough good things about this guy live. That's I'm awesome. Just, Completely. I've seen him, you know, with the solo band when he played Rock Loma a few years ago. Yeah. But, you know, that's a different thing. You're outside. It sounded good, but yeah. you don't really get the full experience of You really got a full thing Unless here. you're in a club, you know. I see, yeah. And Cinderella countless times, but that's been quite a many years. Yeah, definitely. But anyway, yeah, Tom Kiefer. Check out that album, too, if you haven't, The Way Life Goes. I've got the purple vinyl. Nice. It's badass. Nice. I'll borrow it. Yeah. Um... I was listening to Eddie Trunk the other day, and some guy called up, and he was like, Hey, uh, do you ever know like what happened to Cinderella and Tom Kiefer? I bet he could do a killer solo album. <laughs> and Eddie Trunk just like hung up on him. He was like, um, right. he's had a solo album out for three years, click. <laughs> and he, you know, it pissed him off, you know, because... <clears throat> In the age of Google, you should never have to a a ask those questions. Right. But I thought that was funny. Just a little side note there for you. Yeah, if you type Tom Kiefer in Google, the first thing that's going to pop up, probably Cinderella, and the second thing will be probably the way life goes. Mm -hmm. It's not uncomplicated. That's right. <laughs> Speaking of Eddie Trunk, was he there? Did he host it? Yeah, he hosted it. Nice, nice. Yeah. All right. Yeah, he got up there, and he had good things to say about rocket science after they played, which is cool. Really? Yeah. Good. Because he came on before and then came on after them, and then yeah. again before Tom Kiefer. Awesome. Yeah. So, Rocket Science, Tom Kiefer, check him out. Yeah, glad you had a good night. That's awesome. All right, Mark Kendall of Great White. 
making his return to our podcast. That's right. Quite an honor to be able to say that. A total honor. We talked about it. If you haven't listened to the, the first one, go back and check that out. You know, it was a good lengthy one, just like this one is. And, you know, we talk about a lot of different stuff. And, you know, on that one, we talked about, you know, how much we love Great White. And yeah. The past stuff and everything. And this one, you know, that was before this new album was out. And this album just came out this past this past week. This is a fantastic album. Great album. Yeah, I mean, you can, I mean, from the get-go, like it opens with I'm Alright, and that's just a great, not only a great album opener, but it sounds like something that would be great to open with live. Yeah. And it's just got that real feel-good feeling to it, and it sounds like classic, you know, Great White. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, just from from that point on, this album is... Yeah, moving on, I love that song. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, moving on has that real, that, that solo in it, you remember, has that... It starts with that that clean kind of picking thing, and then yeah. goes into his classic bluesy thing. But oh, it's yeah. got both of them in there. And I mean, this whole this whole thing, you know, this is the life has really killer bluesy vocals, and you know, I mean, Terry's vocals throughout this thing are just out of this world, you know, for this style of of rock. Yeah. And what else, you know, like the the single "Big Time." That's a good song. When that opens, it's that classic. You know that prodding kind of thing that that like face the face the day yes. or rock me has, yeah. Where it's like that kind of prodding something, pulsing. yeah. They're yeah. pulsing in, and you know it's going to lead to something. <laughs> and that's exactly what Big Time does without technically sounding like either of those songs. It just has that great white feel. Yeah, you know? yeah, great white. They're good at that. Yeah, but even like Cry of a Nation is this great slow groovy kind of broody blues thing that has another killer solo and. Just the chorus, you know, gets stuck in your head by the end of it. And this, you know, there's tons of great solos on this and the vocals. And I just I can't say enough good things about this album or this band as a whole because yeah. they've never had albums that weren't good. Yeah. They've never had an album that I put in and go, like, eh, I don't want to hear this again. <laughs> you know, the, I like this better than I like Elation, but Elation's a great album. Yeah. And this has more of a, I was trying to pinpoint it. It's like darker. Yeah. It just Not seems really. a little bit more like, you know, like they're really, they're really finding themselves on this one. Right. You know, with, with, you know, to, with Terry being in the, in the band and stuff. Could be. They're really getting into it, you know. But it's, the, as a whole, like the, it seems even more bluesy, but yeah. it, it doesn't seem like it's that pick up blues, you know, yeah. that. That rock blues, obviously. Exactly. I mean, that's what Great White has always done. But there's just something more to it. Maybe it's fuller. You know, maybe that's Michael Wagner's influence. Too, yeah, could you know? be. Yeah, and that's the thing to mention here is, you know, Michael Wagner's producing. I mean, so how can you go wrong when he's, you know, driving the boat? Yeah. I mean, he can't. And, you know, Mark Kendall's signature guitar, just his, that guitar hum and tone is there. And, you know, it's just, uh, you know, it, it just like... Wraps its arms around you, makes you feel good. That's what it does. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, and to go back, Mark, excuse me, Michael Wagner, you know, produced their very first album That's back right. in like '84. Yeah. And you know, has hasn't done anything with them since then. So that's kind of a full circle. There hence, you go. Hence the title. Yeah. You know. And they, the, if you buy the album, it comes with this really cool behind the scenes documentary making of the album yes which is really neat and we talk about that here in this interview but yeah that was it's really cool because it's really well done yeah. and it you get an input from all five members of the band and it's really and from michael wagner as well it's a really cool documentary it's like 40 45 minutes so definitely check that out if you get a chance to yeah but just like i said earlier you know when we had him on before we kind of before the thing went into Stuff about old Great White, but just not to like totally rehash, but like what's your favorite Great White album, if you can name one? Man. That's kind of tough for me, but it I... It is. I've always been Psycho City. Yeah. And it's just... Because I loved him well before that. You know, like every kid of that era, it was 1988, I loved Twice Shy, and then Hooked right after that. Oh, but, yeah. I you mean, know, all the hits were there, but when Psycho City came out, just something about it grabbed me because it was that... It was 92 whenever everything was changing. Yeah. And they still sounded like Great White, but they did push it to a little darker point. 
with some of those songs and then big goodbye is just this amazing fucking rock huge that's, song i mean that song that thing's yeah. got balls yeah you and know? on the complete opposite end of that love is a lie yeah it's just like one of the most fantastic love ballads ever you know it's that's like right. this eight minute long opus that just gets like totally dark but you can't stop listening to it you know amazing guitar solo amazing <clears throat> vocals from jack russell and this unbelievable you know i i I liked I liked Sail Away. I knew you were gonna say that too. You know, you remember we saw that tour? What a great show that was. Yeah. You know, I don't know why that that one you know really got to me. Yeah, and it's if you haven't heard Sail Away, you got to go back and do it. Yeah. It's I have you know I I thought of two or three months ago I thought I haven't listened to this in a while, <laughs> and it was actually when I was driving to Joplin to get the get a tattoo. That's right. From Dennis of Crane Technique. Gotcha. I popped in. Sail Away by Great White and listen to that on the way there. It was awesome, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. It just, it stands the test of time for sure. <laughs> and it's all, it's more acoustic based than all the other stuff. So it's one of those great feel good Sunday morning type albums. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> but yeah, people, if you're one of those people, I'm just going to say it. If you're one of those people that doesn't give bands a chance because they don't have the singer that you grew up loving. Yeah. You're missing out on some great music. Yeah. You're, yeah. Yeah. This album, Andalation, Full Circle, is just great. And he doesn't sound like Jack, which is great. You don't want that. No. But when you replace a guy like Jack Russell, you obviously got to have someone who has a blues feel so it fits you know, the, the music of Great White. Yeah. And Jack had that old school kind of rock blues feel like Robert Plant or someone. But Terry has, I, and I think Mark even talks about that in this interview, that more English feel, but it's more straight up blues yeah but he does it in a rock fashion to where it totally fits great white and it takes it to a different place yeah. but you still know who you're listening to the whole time well that's a perfect fit yeah well let's get into this well Definitely. before we do let me tell you thunderunderground.com soundcloud.com backslash thunder dash underground all the previous episodes up there and every monday night at 7 p.m central on www.102.7wsnr you can hear us as well Let's get into this Mark Kendall of Great White. You too, man. I was really excited when I heard it was you guys calling. We appreciate it. Yeah. Sorry about the, uh, the what was it, the Thunder Down Under mix-up a month or so ago when you tried to search us. I heard you got like some uh, oh <laughs> weird well, website. No, what, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, what I was doing is uh, just tagging you guys just so you know what we're up to and stuff. Yeah. But I tagged the wrong thing. It was like, you know, the... Th- Thunder Gaming Underground <laughs> or something. I don't know about it. When I went to the website, it scared me. Well, I'm glad we got it straightened out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> Pretty funny. Well, so Full Circle's coming out here in a couple weeks. I know right off the bat when I hear that title, I think, you know, you guys are working with Michael Wagner again, but is there any other thing that the title relates to for you? No, we're not smart enough. Um, <laughs> what happened was we just didn't want to name it after a song. We wanted it, you know, to have it mean something because it was pretty special, uh, you know, working with Wagner. Um, so we just, uh, Michael actually came up with that title. What about Full Circle? Because we were throwing a million names around. It's like when you're trying to name your band. It's yeah. like you're looking in the encyclopedia and all that. Well, um yeah, and Michael came up with that name. It kind of makes sense to me. You know, he did our first EP, first album, and here we are 30-plus years later, you know. So it just sounded like it made sense. What do you think with Terry being in the band now, this being the second album, how has that progressed? Do you feel, feel this album has moved you further along than you did with Elation? I, yeah, absolutely. It's a couple notches above that level, and his performance is pretty uh, stellar. Um yeah, so, uh, yeah, I mean, he, 
We're just tighter. Um, I understand his voice completely. I know his strengths and uh, he's really in the power. He has a lot of power in, in the higher ranges and, uh, you know, his voice uh, melts with my guitar. That's what I like the most. He really, truly is a, a blues rock singer straight ahead. And years ago, when, when he first got in the band, um, I, I went back and listened to uh, uh, XYZ because I, I really wasn't that familiar apart from that one song, uh, Inside Out or whatever. He, he sounded pretty incredible in that. But some of the other stuff I was listening to, it was a little bit of oil and water with his voice and, and some of the songs. So, um, yeah, it's just... Uh, the songwriting's getting better. We're really comfortable, you know, with him in the band. Um, so, yeah, everything's working out. You know, he's a good songwriter. He contributes a lot of ideas and stuff. So, you know, it truly is a, a group effort. Well, uh, how do you feel that uh, Full Circle sits in with, with the rest of the Great White Catalog? Now, now that it's done and, and you can just hear it and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, well, it, um, I think it fits well because we haven't changed the way we write songs, you know. Yeah. It's, uh, we're pretty old school, you know. We get in a room and jam until something happens or, you know, either Michael or I will come in with a riff that we want to work on. And, you know, so we develop the songs exactly the same way. We haven't changed any. We don't email each other our parts or anything, you know. <laughs> It's, as far as, you know, this technology thing, it's like your singer doesn't even have to show up. You just send him the song and he sings it at home or something. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, we we just write the same way. And um, as far as fitting in with uh, everything um, it, from the past, you know, it's a different singer. But, this, you know, I think the songwriting is improved uh you know, there's a lot of good material on this record. The feedback's been pretty amazing. And for us to be coming out with Big Time, that wasn't really our plan, but we really didn't know what song to come with first. So we played it for a lot of people, and they kept coming with that because it has kind of all the uh, vintage great white stuff with the dynamics and the big chorus and all that. So. We go, let's just listen to the fans for once and we'll just do that one, you know. Because it's the eighth song on the record. You usually don't hide your your first single, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Well, well, you, you said something a minute ago. Um, you guys were all re together in the studio and, and recording or playing while the vocals were being laid down or the drums. Uh, that's refreshing because, like you said, so much stuff is emailed back and forth. Uh, I, I yeah. can only imagine that just helped the record so much, so much more. It helps the energy because yeah. um, it, it's much different. You know, when we get together in one room and play together, it, it it makes a certain sound, just like any band. And if we did everything separately, that to me that'd be kind of goofy. Mm -hmm. um, so we just we keep it old school. You know, the human connection, hanging out. You know, playing the stuff together, working it out, and everything as a group. And you know, we we did something we'd never done before, which is is hire a company to come in the studio and document the entire process. You know, the arguments, the you know, uh, the whole recording. You know, they did interviews with Wagner. So I just thought that would be cool to uh, for the fans. You know, to be able to see. You know, not just come backstage, but literally come in the studio and watch us, watch songs develop, you know. Yeah, we actually watched that making of. And one thing that jumped out to me was that all five of you were featured. And a lot of times when you see those things, they focus on one or two guys and the other uh -huh. three guys you see just a little bit. So I thought it was really cool how you guys spread that out where every guy had equal time. And it was just kind of refreshing sure. on my end to see. You know, it would have been all me if it was up to me, but, you know, <laughs> you get, no, I'm kidding. No, but uh, truly, uh, if you see how passionate we are about the songs, there was one section in there where I, 
I'm like almost crying. I want this part to be my way so bad. <laughs> and, and, it, and it really is because of the song. I, I really felt strongly about this one part. Terry wanted to cut it in half, you know, get to the chorus quicker is I guess what he was thinking. But I'd already played it over and over in my head and I knew it was going to work. And so I go, you know, I'm like, why don't you like it? it you know what I mean? Please say yeah. you like it, you know. So I played it like four times, it, and we left it all in. And uh, he goes, you know what? I do like that. <laughs> <laughs> so and in the end of the day, the song usually wins. You know, it's not about egos or anything like that. It's just we're, we're all fighting. We all want the best for the song. And sometimes, you know, when two people aren't hearing it the same way, that's the only time you might get a little bit of a spat, you know, but nothing, nothing too serious. At least we don't ar argue over drama. That's always we're arguing about a song. You yeah. Know? <laughs> so that's that's not so bad. That's yeah. That's a little better. <laughs> well, uh, you know, in this documentary, you talked about how cool it would be to see the making of uh, you know this album or that album, and that's kind of why you were doing it. What what, what making yeah. what making of album would you like to see like the most? Well, I'll tell you the the way I got the idea is uh, about. I think eight years ago or so, I saw this making of Machine Head, one of my all-time favorite records, yeah. you know, uh, Machine Head. But it was done t like 25 years after the fact or whatever. Um, but it was so interesting, and I was just engulfed in this. I probably watched it four times. Just the way they recorded it was so uh, off this lobby of a hotel in this tiny little area and to pull off everything they did. It was one of the quickest albums they ever recorded in three weeks. And they, they all played together and all that. And I just thought it was such a cool thing. You know, I, I mean, I'm the biggest geekiest fan known to man. I mean, I get nervous when I, you know, meet Blackmore or meet any one of my heroes. So, if I feel that way, I don't see why our fans wouldn't feel that way, you know, to see that, you know, to see how, how we make records. Because we're pretty pretty isolated. Uh, most bands are, you know, as far as seeing anything like rehearsal or in the studio or whatever. It's always the real structured meet and greet, you know, 20 people flying through, this guy screaming at him, okay, just sign one thing and you know, and all that kind of thing. So I just said, man, we have this opportunity in this great studio with Michael Wagner and everything. Let's roll cameras, you know. So I, I, I'm happy that we did it. Well, when you're doing that, do you feel, is everything still feel natural to you? Or is everybody, you know, you know the camera's right there, so you're not, do you think about that? Or do you guys, is that something? Not at all, not at all. Not at all. I mean, after a while, you don't even know they're there. It's like it's a lot of the stuff that I seen on the video. I'm going, I don't remember that guy filming. You know, um, so we're we're so engulfed in our own world, we weren't really thinking about that that much. You know, so no, not really. You know, yeah. You know, <laughs> they couldn't really get a lot of Audi when he was recording because. Um, that room, he had like 26 mics on his drums and in the room and everything. So, I mean, you couldn't have a guy in there even breathing while he's playing. <laughs> and, through, and through the glass, it's too much reflection, you know what I mean? Yeah. So we didn't get a ton of Audi. We got him like warming up and, you know, he played to a track and the guy just stood there. Um, but I, I, don't, I think he was just practicing to it or something. So unfortunately, we didn't get uh, get that on tape. And like I said, because he 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 doesn't mic like a normal engineer. I mean, he has so many room mics, you know, just ridiculous. So, well, have you guys talked about any of the, these songs besides Big Time that you're going to try to fit into the live set? Are there any of them that jump out to you? Yeah, I mean, we pretty much want to do everything. At at one point, we've. Uh, when we were coming up with the songs, we were having fun just like when they were just kind of done. <laughs> we, we were loving the way they felt uh, groove-wise and everything. Um, 
So, I mean, I think it's a pretty good record. Do you guys like it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, I was I was going to say, uh, when you're talking about, you know, big time, moving on, it's great. I can't, I listened to it last night, can't get out of my head. Yeah, moving on, that's, that, it's a possibility for the next yeah. single. I, I, I really like when the band launches in. It just has that kind of stinky groove, if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like the band comes in, it's just that gung, 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 gung. I always like kind of like grooves like that. So, yeah, you know. There's a lot of different looks on the record. And, um, you know, we came up, uh, I, I really felt the ballad was pretty strong, one of our stronger ballads in, in the last few years. So that was pretty cool. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know. We're just going to do like two at a time, just like mm -hmm. we normally do. We don't, unless we did some special kind of night where we just play the whole record or something and just maybe play once bit twice shy and rock me you know we could do something like that but yeah. just to play a couple it's always better i think to not bombard people with a bunch of new music i've seen a band do that before and and i was like in the audience which i normally wouldn't do that but it was i did, didn't really care that night i was in utah and uh and they played the first three quarters of the set nothing but new stuff and people look like, you know, if it was a cartoon, it'd be like question marks all around their heads, you know? <laughs> and, and then they launch into something that people know, and they're like, yeah, you know? Yeah. Like, you know, the big delay on the crowd response. So I think it's better if you just kind of ease them in and, and let them trip on it, especially if they're familiar with the record, you know? Yeah. That's always better, too, because they might have a couple favorites off the record, you know, at least know them a little bit. Well, on the uh, on the dock, you know, one of the sections was uh, talking about all the the different personalities and and how they gel. Um, you know, talk about how you uh, yeah, you know, handled all the you know this guy wants this or that guy wants that and how it all kind of came out. Yeah, um, everybody has different personalities. Um, just in life, that's just the way it is. You know, yeah. some people are reserved. Some people are a little bit more more of a forward you know confidence and you know and somehow our personalities are so different it, it somehow fits the puzzle you know what i mean yeah it's like because if the more aggressive guy maybe goes off the reserve guy is always going to kick back and wait for it to end you know instead of if you had two strong heads you, you might see some button you know what i mean but yeah. we really don't fight a lot because our you know, our egos, you know, these days, especially, I mean, the past 10 years or so, nothing really matters to us but the songs, you know. So all the stupid stuff, you know, the little piddly things. And, and the other thing that I think helps is, is the whole band's, you know, kind of sober, you know. Yeah. So... When you've got guys that have hangovers and stuff, you know, a lot of arguments might stem from just not feeling well. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. yeah. So we're, we're able to get along. Um, you know, so that, that part of it's really good. You know, we really didn't, um, we weren't fully prepared on this album in the sense uh, it kind of was going to happen, then it kind of wasn't. Our schedules were just messed up. And then... We actually found out it was going to help happen. We were kept kind of waiting until the last minute. Somehow we had a lot of shows, and um, so we literally practiced for eight days, and four of them were in a kitchen, and we got nothing done. <laughs> Audie was just playing his little practice drum thing, you know, his little machine drum, and uh, you know, everybody was just showing each other their ideas and stuff. But when we were four days away, uh, literally leaving on day six with one day just to chill to go to Wagner's, he, he kept saying, where's the music? Where's the music? I need to hear this stuff, you know? And so we recorded, we rehearsed for four days, and on day five, we went in and played one song at a time with, with Terry just scatting and sent him that. It was recorded off an iPad. He's like, I don't hear the guitar. He's like, Make another tape, you know. <laughs> so he, he's he's you know 
Michael Wagner is is a high end pro, and he does things a certain way. And this really wasn't the way he normally does it. Normally, he comes out where you're at, does rehearsals for a week, um, then you do a demo for him two months before you're going to record. He works on the songs, you know, and then you come in and everybody knows everything, and, and you just record. We come in with like no lyrics, hardly just some chorus ideas arrangements sort of done we changed a lot of things so he was kind of thrilled when it was all done i think it like a sigh of relief that it turned out great you know <laughs> and and so are we but i i think even though we weren't like totally prepared the energy was always up and so it translated well because the stuff was real new to us like we'd never heard it finished obviously and you know, instead of doing a demo and re, you know and playing it through a million times and then you record it, and you're you're almost kind of over it at that point. I mean, it doesn't really have that electricity that it has when it's fresh and new. And actually, we were more prepared on this album than we were Elation. Elation, we had no i we only had two ideas, no songs. Uh -huh. We went in in the morning. We went in the morning, we got three acoustic guitars and just sat around until we came up with something that was doable, and then recorded it. Uh, Terry's scatting again. He'd go home and work on lyrics, come back the next day, we'd work on some more lyrics, and, and another song. We just did that every day until we had the record, but um, that, was, that was too much, so we didn't want to go there again. You know, when you don't have any ideas and you're paying like, you know, five or six hundred dollars a day for the studio. It's like you know, <laughs> it, it's not where you should do it. The way you should do it, um, but it worked out good because the way Michael Wagner records is um, the whole band plays together, and to get the drum track. So once the drum track's done, all our rhythms are al already on the track. So then we do the bass, and then. Uh, we do one. He does one song at a time, so that gave us a chance. We know what we're going to work on tomorrow, and, and, and we finish the song in two days. We know what we're working on, so we all worked on lyrics together. You know, the night before, it, you know, the ones that weren't quite finished or whatever. And so, the first day we would finish all the guitars except for the solos and fills. And then the singer would come in that night and do the vocals. So yeah. every day we went in there, we had a, a finished song. So I, I like working like this for the reason that the singer never has to sing like four songs in a day. You know, nobody can get burned out because you're just, too, and all your focus is on one song. You know what I mean? Instead of doing like rhythm guitars for like four or five songs. You know, and then this, then you finish the five songs, and then the singer has to sing them all. You know, nobody ever gets burnt that way. And I, I'm sure Michael Wagner has learned that from just recording so many bands. I mean, that that's the best way to work. Yeah. Earlier, Efficiency, you know. Earlier you mentioned how Terry's voice melds with your guitar, but you also said that yeah. you said you write the same way that you always have. Does correct? Do you write? Do you just not write with the voice in mind, or is this just make it? E Does his voice make it easier to no. think about that? No, I write the same way I always write. It's just I stay away from the foreigny type ballads, you know, like uh, certain ballads that have no blues quality to them, um, because his strengths in ballad when you do a ballad is to stay away from the real sappy ballads at least in my opinion. If you have a ballad that's a little bit like, if he can sing more like Marriott in it, or, you know, mm. his style, I just think it, fit, it fits him better than to sing like, um, I don't know, something you'd hear in the old days on AM radio that's like, you know, you light up my life and shit like that. <laughs> uh, he, he just sound, he sounds good. That's what I mean about his strength. His strength is more of a soulful ballad as opposed to a sappy, I love you, I love you, I love you ballad. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So that's one thing I learned about his voice. And the other is 
big riff songs, you know, where where he can show a lot of power. Um, you know, he he he's real strong in that area. You know, so so I'm not I'm not really writing any certain way. It's just I'm staying away from you know more uh, of you know I'm keeping it bluesy, which is more comfortable for me, anyways. So it's it's real simple. Yeah. Well, well, uh, you know? talk about uh, talk about your tone a little bit because you seem to have like the it's 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 meaty and it's heavy, but it's not overdriven and it's just. It's just what you need. And how did you culminate that over the years? Um, you know, I, it's really funny. And for some reason, I, I mean, I'll give you an example. I, I went to play on a Glenn Hughes record one time. And I didn't have an amp. And they didn't have any amps in, in the studio except this, like, Ampeg combo amp. And... I plugged in and did all my parts in like 20 minutes. And he goes, all right, you just set the new bar. Now every guitar player that comes in there, they got to do the same thing. But it didn't sound any different than any record I played on. My sound was the same, really, yeah. real similar. So it's not like I have this this magic amp where I get a certain sound. Um, and in fact, on this album, for the first time ever, and I really didn't trust it at first until I heard it, I used a Kemper. Oh, which wow. is, um, yeah, you know, the Kemper is the, one of the best non-amp situations that you can play and play through because the amp um, samples are real, real profiles of amps. So literally, you get the exact same sound waves as you do for an amp. And Wagner's even A and B the real amp and versus the other, and you can't tell the difference at all. It has features on it to where you can push the tubes more, yeah. so you really feel like you're playing through an amp. It's not like, this is an amp farm, you know, it's not cheapy. It's real profiles, like, you know, a guy actually got the exact, you know, and I tried it, I heard it, you know, I didn't believe it. I go, no, put, put some mics on an amp and let me scream loud, you, you know. Be screaming loud, you know, through an amp. He's like, well, you want to at least try it? And I go, yeah, I'll try it. And I tried it, and I was like, holy God, man. <laughs> this is this is really cool. And and <laughs> the thing, uh, the also the thing about it is you're not dealing with mics on cabinets and, you know, room mics. And it's just totally perfectly consistent all the time. Mm -hmm. So I just use really old Marshalls through, like, greenback cabinets you know, I mean, you know, uh, it, it's uh, profile stuff, but it, I felt like I was playing through Marshall, you know, yeah. and just so, um, but it's also, uh, as far as, you know, the sounds and stuff, um, yeah, I, I go a little cleaner sometimes just so the notes speak well, um, but I still like it heavy, and sometimes... If you use less distortion, it's even heavier than when you have a lot of distortion, because you still get the crunch, but you hear the you hear the the musical part of it, the the notes, you know. Because I can always get more distortion; that's not a problem. But I can't get more note value. You know what I mean? Yeah. You can't. Oh, turn up my notes. You know what I mean? <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> You know, so I like it when it's musical because a lot of times I play chords when I'm playing through something loud. Yeah. Um, I'm playing these big full chords with open strings and stuff. If um, if I have tons of distortion, I also use real low output pickups. These TV Jones TV Jones pickups are super low output, and so it's musical kind of coming from the guitar, anyways, and. That doesn't bother me because I can use a pedal and add more level or more, you know, as far as a live situation. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, I really don't do a lot. Um, most of, I get pretty much everything I need from my volume knob on my guitar because I'm kind of a roll-off player. I don't, I don't have the, you know, thousand preset pedal board that keeps me in one area for days, you know. Yeah. 
like you're playing live and you're just standing at your pedal board all night. <laughs> so I, I just I just keep it, it like if I want it clean, I just turn down my volume knob. I'm, I have like chorus and stuff like that in a, in a delay, but but it, I love that control that you have mm -hmm. with using your volume knob on your guitar because you can feel it, you know, as opposed to a clean pedal going from clean to dirty and you hit the clean pedal and it's, you know, in the certain situation you're in, you might do something with the volume on your guitar, but when you have that preset, and, and also it sounds kind of phony, and one, one time I was playing in Japan, and, you know, my roadie wasn't doing anything but changing strings, so I go, hey, dude, I got a job for you. Do all my switching, and even, I even made him play my wah-wah pedal. Yeah. Which it sounds lazy on my part, but I only used it on one song and it was very controlled. So, um, so I'm playing, and it's supposed to go to the clean, and also it's kind of like a, almost a second before when you change to the other part. So I always kind of muted my hand real quick and then went to it. Well, this one show we're playing in, I think it was Tokyo. It's supposed to go to the the awesome clean sound, and he accidentally hit the wrong button, and I was Tony Iommi on the breakdown. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So that's pretty frightening, you know. I never let anybody do my switching again, you know. How'd you how'd you but, recover from that? <laughs> oh my God! Well, he 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 recovered, but. It was already too late. I already made the big, bah, you know, <laughs> out of nowhere. When it, it was, it was actually the breakdown in in rock, rock me. Okay, you know when it's coming out of that chorus and everything, and then you go back into the mellow. Yeah, it was there, and he went to more distortion than I even had on the chorus. Oh, no. It was like crazy. <laughs> it was like a solo sound for <laughs> some certain song, but. These days, I'm pretty stripped down, and I, like I said, I get most of what I need with the volume. Yeah. Well, uh, on that documentary, you were playing that, that I don't know what kind of guitar it was. It was kind of a natural finish with a maple neck. Uh, what kind of guitar yeah. was that? I thought that was really cool. Yeah. Um, it, it seems actually, like I've seen you live with that one, too, I think. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's called an RH Custom, made by this guy named Rick Harrison, who was... Actually, he's been building guitars for about 20 years, but for for uh, quite a few years before that, he made pool cues for pros. Wow. So he's actually a, a pool cue maker, so obviously he's real good with wood, but he's also a musician. He plays, plays little clubs and stuff, and he started to get pretty good building guitars. So I had like four meetings with him because almost every guitar I've ever owned, I always settled. You know, it's like I love everything but this one thing, mm -hmm. you know, but it's still awesome. I still love the guitar. Okay, so I wanted to go just say I love everything and not have to say except for this one thing, get me? <laughs> so we had four four meetings. We went over all the wood and, and electronics and the kind of pickups I wanted and and it, it just turned out perfect, you know. But, yeah, it's just a local guy. He's not real famous or anything. But instead of doing a line of guitars all like mine, he only does one of a kind. Like, right. you know, so he just likes to do it like that. So he's obviously not out to make a bunch of money off artists. He, like, he'll make, you know. I, I suppose if somebody asked to have my guitar... He, he would do something similar, but it wouldn't be, like, totally exact. So the company I was with before that, years ago, they were out to make money. I mean, they made, like, 40 guitars just like mine. Yeah. So I don't know why he does that. I guess he, you know, is not really that concerned. He's more concerned with the art of building. And he, he likes to build the guitar exactly like the artist wants. So he, he's not out to try to make money off, you know, Bigger name guitar players, not putting my me in that category, but <laughs> yeah, you know, you know what I mean. Oh yeah. <laughs> Going back a few years or several years, Jenny Lane filled in with you guys for a little bit, and I was just curious. That's true. He obviously doesn't have as bluesy as a voice as Terry or Jack does. 
So was that a weird experience or did you have great memories of that time period? Wonderful memories. Um, for one thing, well, he was more uh, doing the clone thing. Like he, he did everything, every line exactly like the record. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, his wife had told me that for, for two weeks straight, he just had great white plane everywhere, you know, the whole set. And so when he came in, he was fully prepared. He knew all the lyrics and he sang everything perfect. And uh, <clears throat> so, um, you know, he did real good shows, about 10, I think he did 10 shows. We, we just didn't want, you know, like a, a clone. But I became very close with Janie because he, he was struggling with sobriety a little bit. And, um, you know, I work with addicts and, and uh, guys struggling um, almost daily. And so I was working with him. And on, on those shows, he was dead nuts sober. And he was never late to anything. He was just completely professional. And um, we talked a lot about it, about his sobriety. And he told me that, you know, when he's out doing this stuff with us, he's totally fine. He, he, you know, his wife was out to be supportive or whatever. But he just said, you know, he, he digs it. And, and he was singing real good. I remember being outside of this airport, and it was like 10 in the morning or whatever, and he's sitting with his wife. He looked really good. He's singing his ass off. He's singing great. You know, The fans are saying they haven't heard him sing this well in 20 years. And I go, what's wrong with this, man? You know, like your fans say you're sounding better than ever. You know, it's a beautiful day. You look great. Your wife looks awesome. I go, you know, like what's, what's wrong with this picture? And he's like, nothing, dude. He goes, I love this. He goes, uh, you know, like, I want to be sober more than anything, you know, more than anything. He goes, when when the devil's voice hits my head, it's usually, it's usually when I'm home and I'm doing nothing. So if he stays busy, he does well, you know. Although sometimes he'll go off, even, I guess, in that position. But um, so I was pretty shocked when he died, you know. I... I uh, I went to his memorial because I wanted to go up and speak so so all his fans and family and everybody would know that he wanted to be sober more than anything. You know, this this was just the uh, the demons just overcame the guy, you know. Mm -hmm. But anyways, yeah, he he was a good dude. And the other thing that was great about Janie Lane that people don't know is is he saved his band. I mean, he, uh, you know, they just wanted to sign him. And and he begged and did everything to get, you know, have his band be involved in, you know. So he's, he's a talented dude, I'll tell you that much. He, could, he wrote all that stuff they did, so something to say about that. Yeah. Well, you mentioned recovery and everything, and you, you post a lot about that on Instagram and everything. How's it mm -hmm. for you whenever you're out on the road or at festivals or something? Is it where that's more of an atmosphere that's conducive to having all that around? Is it easy for you now or is it still hard? Well, it, it becomes easier as time goes on. You know, I'm almost to nine years. And, and even when I'm out there, I'm always working with somebody or talking to somebody that's like having a hard time or maybe somebody that's doing good. You know, I'm in touch with these. I started this, like, a little more than five years ago. All I did was reach out on Facebook and just say, hey, if anybody's out there struggling with uh, addiction, alcohol, drugs, whatever, I'm available to be your sober friend. That's all I offered. I'm not offering any miracles or anything just to have support and, you know, you know, just a friendship, you know, and just kind of maybe share share what helped me you know mm -hmm. and it started with one guy and now i have like 93 people wow and you know i send them prayers and meditation every day we chat on the internet about you know different things and uh you know really stay in touch close and they're all you know involved with outside programs and stuff like that so it's just something kind of extra so, and it was all just for offering my friendship. It's kind of mind blowing. Definitely. A lot, a lot of guys are doing good. A lot yeah. of guys are doing good, you know. Definitely. 
<laughs> you talked a lot about that documentary that you guys had with that concert, you know, that was coupled with that concert from Vegas a couple years ago. Right. And that didn't... That's coming out. Still hasn't come out. Yeah, Is there yeah. like a release date yeah, on I know. It? Yeah. Isn't that insane? It's totally insanity. <laughs> a lot of that reason was uh, some of the bands, you know, kept wanting to fix things, and it just went on and on. Like with Extreme, they they did a lot of things that they wanted to uh, fix, and and just time went on and on. I think they had problems with money, um, the the production company. But it's finally finished, and I guess it's coming out any time. I mean, it's literally finally done. Now, there was something wrong with the sound of the live show. It sounded like we were doing it. It was so dry, it just sounded like a board mix, and it was because they used the wrong file. So yeah. they had to redo that, but it didn't take long to get it back into surround or whatever. But, yeah, it, it's, a very, it's like a two-hour documentary, and then it's... Uh, it's a three disc set that is a documentary, just a few interviews, and then just a CD of the show. So it's a pretty, uh, you know, thorough look at our past up to now. So I think that the fans will, you know, at least be able to know where we came from and, you know, kind of how things developed in the beginning. A lot of people did uh, interviews that. Eddie Trunk, Tesla, you know, um, our manager, our old manager, Alan Niven, interviews, and a bunch of other people. Um, yeah, well, you got a lot of insight from guys like Alan Niven because he was there from the beginning of yeah. Great White, but some of the other people is more like, like with Tesla, for instance, uh, on the Judas Priest tour, on days off, you know, they would do three shows, day off, two shows. Well, on those days off, we'd play, like, clubs and stuff. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we played up north, and there was this band that opened for us. They were playing, like, docking covers, and they, they sounded pretty darn good. I mean, the singer was awesome, guitar player, great. And it was a band called City Kid. Well, later yeah. on, they became Tesla. And... Before he knew it, we were touring with him. It was just, it, it was, uh, I was so happy for those guys. I couldn't believe how good they were, you know, because the last time I saw them, they were doing, you know, show me the way, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, like, you know, docking covers and all this, you know, you, you don't figure that, you know, just a couple of years later, they're going to have this big album and, you know, they're signed to like whatever, Geffen. And, yeah. You know, so, and then all of a sudden they're on tour with us and we're co-headlining. I mean, these guys are just this little cover band. I had no idea. But I, I did, I remember thinking, man, these guys are real good. I, that singer, you know, if they ever do originals, it could, could be something, you know. Yeah. So that, that was, you know, they shared that stuff. And it, 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 like I said, it was a real good account. We, we actually went to areas where we started so you can get a visual, you know. Mm hmm and it's a pretty pretty good documentary. It's done very well. It just took forever. I just couldn't believe it. I mean, Te uh, Twisted Sisters video, I think, went number one in Billboard. And, and uh, Extremes, I think, did very well, too. So yeah. hopefully uh, people want to look at that. Is there that release, you know. Is there old footage involved, too? Or is it mainly just you guys talking about the... Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's old footage of Jack Russell and... Uh, you know, old footage of us playing and clubs and stuff, and, you know, I was hoping I could find this one, this one tape, but I, I could not find it, and I even asked the guys, the, the PA company that did the gig, it was like in 1980, I think, and, or 1981, I believe, we opened for, uh, or 82, I'm sorry, it was 82, we opened for uh, Motorhead at this place and we all we were jumping around so much it, it, we all looked like we just you know landed on the sun or something <laughs> and it was just crazy i mean i was flying all over the place and and it was a real good show and the sound was excellent it was recorded on a what do you call it a eight millimeter tape yeah but it, the footage the footage and the sound was fine it was it sounded real good 
I was hoping I could find that to really take people back, but I, I, the guy, the film company didn't have it anymore. And years ago, they told me they, they changed it, put it on VHS, but I just, they couldn't, they had no way to find it, I guess. Yeah. But we have some pretty old footage of, of live shows and stuff. Well, I mean, we appreciate your time doing this again. It's an honor to have you back on here. Definitely. Thank you, man. Yeah. Keep. Uh, I'm really happy, uh, appreciative of you guys waving the uh, the old rock and roll flag for all guys like us. You know, uh, we'll, it's pretty we'll, cool. We'll keep doing it. <laughs> plus, plus, you're so informed. I mean, you're so you know, you know your history, and and that's always nice when people know what they're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, thank you, and uh, hopefully, you guys play any music or no? Yeah, we do. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, we usually so play like one song an episode or something. That's awesome. Because uh, I just heard a couple tracks from Night Ranger on some show. Their new album it sounded killer, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, they're awesome. Some of these bands are they're, these bands are coming out with some really good music, and it it's a shame it's only on satellite radio because it. It's really deserving. I mean, most of the, you know, all the radio stations of the past are all classic rock. I mean, so yeah, you're just going to get one, you're going to get once bitten, twice shot until you die. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and, and you guys are, a lot of you guys are making, you know, the best music uh, that you've made in forever. And, you know, radio just doesn't yeah. come around to it. It's sad. I mean, we've hired a team of assassins that just know the internet, <laughs> like like mad, you know, like mad people, yeah. and they're really good at uh, marketing and all that. But I'll tell you, man, it, it's hard to get the music to the people these days. Yeah, well, we'll, but we'll do we'll our best. We just do the best we can. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know. That's what I mean. Guys like you are really helpful because you're letting people know we have a record, and, and that that's a, that's a blessing that we even have that. You know, that's right. That's right. Because we are making the best music we can, you know, and we're we're doing it for the fans, and and so we don't go out and go through the motions or anything, you know, because it really excites us when we have new music. So you're going to get a good show, or the best we can do, at least, you know. <laughs> so it's it's pretty cool, man, that you you guys uh, are still keeping us on the uh, wavelengths. <laughs> for sure. Well, thank you. Well, but anyways, well, thanks again, guys. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, man. Keep it up. Keep up the great work. Bye -bye. You too. We appreciate it. Well, there you go, Mark Kendall, lead guitarist, founding member of Great White. Yes. How cool is that? Uh, super cool. Such an honor to have him on again. Mark is a great guy. Just you know, uh, nice and accommodating as they come. We're just really, really grateful. Definitely. Yeah, quite a, quite a cool thing for us, you know, to be able to talk to him a second time. And chances are. You might hear him on a third time down the line. I sure hope so. So if you dug that, you're a Mark Kendall fan, or you dislike great guitarist or great music, episode 89 of this podcast was the first time he was on. That's right. And we go into completely different things than we did on this one. So be sure and check that one out. And speaking of podcast, if this is your first time listening, soundcloud.com backslash thunder dash underground. You like great white bands from that era. We've had on guys from Warrant, Europe. Trickster, Bullet Boys, Taiketo, Lillian Axe. We go all over the place. We had on Shooter Jennings, Ian Moore. We've had on guys from heavy stuff like Down. We've had on Jimmy Bauer and Kirk Winstein. That's right. Who were also in Down and Crow, uh, yeah, Crowbar and Crowbar. Superjoint. <laughs> we also had on Steven Taylor from Superjoint. We've had on guys from Battlecross, Megadeth, Act of Defiance, Shine Down, Drowning De Pool, Avatar. Death Angel. Oh, yeah. We don't say that enough. Death Angel is one of the most underrated bands <laughs> from the thrash metal genre. That's right. They've, their music now could be better than it was back then. Yeah. And we've got, we had Ted Aguilar on from there. Guys from Soil and King and Truck Fighters and The Sword and Seven Dust. Kiss. Kiss. <laughs> oh, yeah. Kiss. <laughs> I ain't some kid who hasn't want this first cum stain off his leg to tell me what I need in my life. Yeah. Man, we need to get... What's that dude's name? I always forget the comedian's name. Uh, Kyle... Uh, that does perfect um, Gene Simmons and Lars Ork. Um, Craig Gass. There you go. 
It's some gas. It's Craig gas, right? Yeah. We need to get him on to say, you're listening to Thunder Underground featuring Gene Simmons of Chaos. Chaos. He does a perfect Gene Simmons. He does a perfect Sebastian Bach. Yeah. He does a perfect Lars Ulrich. <laughs> well, speaking of <laughs> Lars Ulrich. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, right. What? He's not going to be on the podcast anytime soon. He's not, but we're going to see him live. Oh, that's right. We are. We are. <laughs> Damn it. Forgot. Yeah. Next week. Yes. Metallica is playing Dallas on this hardwired tour they got going on. I don't know what it's called. We got to get there early for Local H. Definitely. (laughs) Local H, Event Sevenfold, and Mike D. That's right. From the Beastie Boys playing all your metal hits. Mike D? I thought it was Mixmaster Mike. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, man. (laughs) Trent. Trent. I just don't know my shit like I used to. You're more of the hip hop guy, too. That's true. Oh, man. (laughs) <laughs> well, anyway, we're going to see Metallica. That's right, yeah. Check this out. In five nights, I'm going to see four four shows, and okay. you're going to see three. Yeah. That first night, Metallica, and everybody we just mentioned, the very, in Dallas, Texas. The next night, in Fort Smith, Arkansas, is the Reliance Code CD release party at yeah. the Sound Room. That also features Vague Vendetta, The Revolutioners, and the Screaming Red, Red Mutiny, Mutiny, who we know and yes, we love. Yeah, definitely. Then Sunday is Father's Day, so yeah. we get a day off. But then Monday is Iron Maiden in Tulsa. Yes. No, sorry, Oklahoma City. Oklahoma City, with Ghost. Ghost, so that'll be... We know that's going to be great. Mm-hmm. We've seen Iron Maiden a couple times now. It's one of the greatest shows you will ever see in your life, bar none. Then the next night in Oklahoma City, Our Lady Peace with Collective Soul and Tonic. I'm going, I'm going to that. You're going to that? Hell yeah. I can't, you know, I was kind of lean on it, but the more I thought about it, I'm like, I can't miss Our Lady Peace. I Me? thought that was the yeah. Sunday between. No, it's Tuesday. Oh, okay. It's the day after. Gotcha. And I'm a huge Our Lady Peace fan. I also love Collective Soul and I yeah. love Tonic, so it's... Where's it at? The Zoo Amp. Okay. All right. So that'll be a fun one. Are you just going to stay in Oklahoma City? I guess so. <laughs> yeah, it'd be easier than coming back and That's driving right. back and forth. Might as well. Well, and then, is it the, no, two weekends after that, then I'm going to Dallas for Romstein one night. That's right. I forgot about that. And Saigon Kick the next night. Hell yes. And this is going to sound crazy to almost every person on earth listening. Yeah. But I'm almost more excited about Saigon Kick than I am Romstein. I get that. I and get that. Because, yeah, I'm probably not because Romstein is literally... Anytime anyone's asked me what the greatest concert I ever saw was, I say Romstein in Dallas. Yeah. It's just half a centimeter, centimeter above Iron Maiden. But if that, it's probably a tie. Yeah. So that's going to be a sight to behold them outside. I've never seen them outside. I've yeah. seen them twice inside. But anyway, the next night is Saigon Kick, and they're always been one of my bucket list bands from that, from any kind of music. And there you go. And from that era, I never got to see them back then, and they mm-hmm. just never tour. That's you know, awesome. And they, they only play Florida and then these festivals and cruises and stuff, so yeah. they're finally doing some Texas dates. I'm not going to miss it. Hell yeah. Yeah, you better go. Yeah. So a lot of concerts coming up that we'll be talking about here on the podcast in the next few weeks. That's right. Hey, next week I'm going to see Amy Hagar. So am I. You got hell yeah! You finally got tickets. Yeah, I like it. Next week, that's like that's this Wednesday. Yeah, it's this Wednesday. What am I talking about? Right. God, my clock's all fucked up. <laughs> right. So yeah, Sammy Hagar in the circle that features Michael Anthony, the only bass player for Van Halen. That's right. Sorry, Wolfgang, I love you, but <laughs> there's only one man that knows how to harmonize his ass off. That's right. And then. Jason Bonham playing the drums. That's right. And Vic from Sammy Hagar's solo band, who is a kick-ass guitarist, worthy yes, of filling in, in for his own right, definitely. Eddie and Jimmy Page because they play some Zeppelin tunes as well. Yep. Since Jason Bonham's back there. That's right. And then of course all the Van Halen and Montrose and Sammy solo you could want. I can't wait. I hope he plays one sip, but I know he's not going. <laughs> hey, you, we can dream. Or what? Uh, I, I'd fall in love again. I don't yeah. think they'll play that either. Well, maybe, maybe they'll play. Uh, Humans being. That would be amazing. Yeah. I would crap. <laughs> Get ready. You would crap on the floor of the River Spirit Casino. Yeah. All right. That'd probably be the best thing a River Spirit Casino ever saw. Behind Sammy? Yeah, well, it's a casino. 
I don't know. I'm getting off track it's, that's here. Second, it'd be the second best thing behind Sammy in the oh, circle. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. There we go. <laughs> there we go. All right. I guess we should reel this back yeah, in. Yeah, we're done. We're done. Yeah, episode 129 once again. Every Monday night at 7 p.m., 102.7 WSNR. It's the biggest rock radio, internet radio station there is. Very privileged to be a part of that. SoundCloud.com backslash Thunder Dash Underground. Facebook backslash The Thunder Underground. YouTube at The Thunder Underground. Tons of stuff on YouTube that is not here on these uh, podcast episodes. And then, of course, we're on Twitter. And as Jason likes to point out, we're on Periscope daily. Yes. So and, get on our Periscope. And MySpace. <laughs> and Friendster. Yes. And I can't think of anything through that. You can search for us on Alta Vista or Ask Jeeves. <laughs> we're on Ello. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. God, turn it off. Until next time. Thunder Underground, y'all.